section eleven of flower patch among the hills this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis flower patch among the hills by flora clickman chapter nine where the road led over the hills next morning i was a wreck virginia and her sister were the same for a week past i had realized that i was in the last stage of mental and physical disrepair the midnight committee was the final straw as a rule i stick at work in town till nerves and brain refuse to hold out another day then flinging my tools down and leaving both my office desk and my study table in a hopeless and bewildering state of piled-up letters manuscripts and proofs i just fly a goodly bale of arrears following me by next post i had had practically no holiday owing to the war and had reached that forlorn and useless frame of mind when i declared i was far too busy to take one a very mistaken notion for any one to have by the way it is surprising how well most of us can be done without when we do at last take a little time off duty however i had just one faint glimmer of common sense left me and that told me to take the first train going west next morning which i did leaving paddington in company with virginia and ursula who had a holiday due to her from the hospital in a warm close fog that might imply a thunderstorm or an early autumn or merely the ordinary airless carbonic acid gloom that is a distinguishing feature of london some eminent authority has said that the air in london hasn't been changed for over a hundred years and i can quite believe it we found the cottage bathed in the glow of the soft sunshine that is still summer but that brings with it the first touch of regret for the good-bye that is near at hand there had been some soaking rains after a dry spell and everything in the garden was holding up bright refreshed leaves and glowing flowers one and all assuring me that though they had a gasping time a few weeks before and had wondered from day to day if they could manage to hold on till the evening things had now taken a glorious turn for the better and they were glad they hadn't given up since i was so pleased to see them several apologized for ragged washed-out blossoms lower down their stem but explained that it was due to the rain and that they were sending up new ones to take the place of the shabby ones as quickly as ever they could the dear things seemed to look at me with such understanding sympathy the pansies held up their bright little faces just like a bevy of inquiring children the hollyhocks i am sure turned round to look in my direction the last of the sweet peas threw out tender little fingers to touch my arm as i passed beside their hedge the golden rod stretched its neck and tiptoed lest i should miss it at the back of the border haven't you noticed that most flowers seem to have faces i don't mean that you can trace a direct resemblance to human features in them as you can in the moon but there is something in the flowers that looks at you something that looks at you shyly as the wild rose or stares at you boldly like the marigold or twinkles at you gaily like the cornflower and coreopsis or appears slightly inclined to frivolity like the larkspur and the ragged robin or takes life with solid seriousness like the canterbury bell or gives you the innocent look of a baby like the primrose or beams at you with large-hearted maternal kindness like a big gloire de dijon most flowers you will find give you a look with some definite characteristic at least so it seems to me 
probably that is one reason why they are so comforting and companionable and i was wanting something comforting and companionable that day i had overworked and generally neglected the rules of common sense till i had got to that dismal pitch that simply asks of blank space what's the good of anything then more questions began to worry me what had christianity accomplished seeing the way the sermon on the mount was being trampled under foot by the instigators of this war after all wasn't might going to win in spite of all one believed of the supremacy of right wasn't the devil having things all his own way now what were christians doing had religion lost its power what were the churches doing was anybody doing anything worth whiles those who have let themselves run down physically and have neglected to take proper meals and have turned night into day and have tried systematically to cram a fortnight's work into every week know exactly where one finds oneself at the end of a few months and it is only the very exceptional people who do not find their spiritual condition about as jaded as their nerves after a course of this sort of thing we get to feel that we are ploughing a very lone furrow and it is only a step further to the state of mind that says it isn't worth ploughing at all personal experience has taught me that there is only one cure for me when i get to this state of nervous wreckage and that is to get away to the solitudes to listen among the great silences of the hills for the still small voice that has never failed those who wait for its message god's methods of restoring weary humanity are many and various sometimes he sees that first and foremost like elijah his tired children need rest and food and just as one of the greatest terrors that can befall the worn-out worker in a city is insomnia so one of the greatest boons that nature in her quietudes bestows is the ability to drop off into peaceful brain-mending oblivion so he giveth his beloved sleep or it may be that he sees his children need to be drawn away from the world for a while in order to talk face to face with him sometimes we have to be brought to a state of great weakness before we will listen to his plea come ye yourselves apart and rest a while we do not always heed it when we are well and strong in the enforced quiet we can find time to turn to him and a sojourn with our lord in the desert has meant for many the feeding of five thousand on the morrow when i am badly in the depths i know of no surer way to restore my mind than a long walk across the hills some people need human companionship but personally i can do very well by myself under such circumstances always provided that i don't meet a cow likewise on a walking tour i can pull myself together more quickly if i don't have to spend time and energy striving to be amiable and politely attentive to some one i have often started out on a sunday morning and walked on till i came upon some unknown church that served as a useful end to my pilgrimage on one occasion i remember discovering a small chapel hidden away among a few homesteads in a pretty valley i unexpectedly tumbled into they were starting the first hymn as i entered there were nine of us all told including the preacher the two ladies who raised two different tunes simultaneously and the rugged-faced deacon or elder who brought me a hymn-book and later took the collection the singing was not a marked success at first owing partly to the divided opinion of the congregation as to which tune they were really singing moreover my entrance had momentarily diverted attention and seemed to make all concerned a trifle nervous but at length the preacher himself started a third tune that we all knew and were able to join in 
and a very sincere and devout service followed i gathered from information impressed upon us in the course of the sermon probably for my special benefit as the handful of cottagers assembled would assuredly know that there was to be a special collection that day on behalf of some chapel fund when i told this to ursula who didn't then know so much about our hill people as she does now she said ah i suppose that was why only nine came but in reality nine was not at all a poor congregation for a tiny hamlet like this on a sunday morning the mothers are mostly at home getting dinner the fathers are seen to the stock and don't reckon to get themselves cleaned up till the afternoon but in the evening then the little building would be packed to the door in his final prayer the minister prayed so earnestly that we might all be induced to give with the greatest liberality that i felt exceedingly sorry i had only put a half crown into my glove when i started out leaving my purse at home the rugged elder looked studiously in the opposite direction while i slipped the coin on to the plate somehow i hoped he wouldn't be too disappointed when he discovered that the respectable-looking stranger had not given more handsomely after the pleading of the preacher but it was all i had after the service i lingered a moment to read a quaint old tombstone in the church precincts the rest of the worshippers likewise lingered respectful but curious in the road outside the gate the preacher had shaken hands with me at the door my rugged friend had been immersed in the duties of his office as steward treasurer and church secretary combined but now he came out of the door looked anxiously about and seeing me still there made straight for me i concluded that he too was going to shake hands and possibly inquire if i was staying in the neighbourhood but what he actually said was this excuse me ma'am but do you happen to know what you put into the plate a half-crown i faltered wondering whether by any remote chance it was a bad one he nodded his head and opening his work-hardened hand displayed the morning's collection seven pennies three half-pennies and my half-crown on top that's right he nodded and then lowering his voice presumably to save my feelings he added but if twas a mistake and you didn't mean to put in all that you can have it back do you know it made a lump come in my throat i told ursula about it at dinner remarking that it looked as though they hadn't much faith even though they had specially prayed for generous giving ursula said that in her opinion it looked as though it was high time i presented to the rag-bag the hat i had worn that morning since it had been for months past a dejected object of pity though with her usual delicacy of feeling she had up to the present refrained from telling me so in plain english but now in all kindness such as only a dear friend can show she had no hesitation in saying that she wasn't at all surprised that they mistook me for an old-age pensioner on the verge of bankruptcy but i've been wandering again to return to that september day when i reached the cottage as weary of life and as downhearted about everything as any mortal could well be the whole world seemed out of joint yet in my innermost soul i knew that religion was really all right and that it was i who had gone wrong but i refused to look at that aspect of it next day i determined to give it all up and just meditated on my own funeral i tried to reckon up how many people i could really rely on to send wreaths it didn't make me feel any the less pessimistic when i decided there were only four who could be counted upon as certainties and they included virginia and ursula and even one of these failed me for when i mentioned the matter to the girls they said 
surely i didn't imagine they were going to be so wasteful as to send two wreaths when one would do quite as well if both their names appeared on the card attached but they did offer to make it a wreath of painted white tin flowers under a glass shade regardless of expense if i preferred suggesting that i might get longer pleasure out of a wreath of this kind getting no more consolation from them than this i said i would go for a walk virginia and ursula anticipated my wishes and declined to accompany me they had urgent work on hand that was far too important to postpone for a mere walk it was the planting of onion seed the week before we had read in the papers how imperative it was that everybody should plant food crops in any available scrap of ground they might possess to help keep starvation at bay we read the article eagerly i had several acres of land doing nothing in particular at the moment that i was only too glad to use for a special crop of eatables against the time of national famine without finishing the article we had started to discuss what would be best to lay down taking into account the idiosyncrasies of our digestions green peas in the small field adjoining the orchard ursula had decided for me and then she proceeded broad beans in half of the upper garden scarlet runners at the back of the strawberry beds and along by the south wall the potato garden can now have carrots parsnips turnips and beets the west garden must have pickled cabbage i mean the cabbage before it is pickled shallots spring onions and pickling onions chives what are chives interrupted virginia i don't know but i've read the name somewhere don't interrupt me and fennel that will come in handy for fish and leeks in that piece of waste ground beyond the barn i think we ought to plant asparagus because after all there is no need to dispense with luxuries if you can grow them for nothing is there and how would it be to plant maize all down that bed where you had the shirley poppies i should think the same aspect would suit the two and some green corn would be very nice i suppose if you plant it now it will be about right in january or february wouldn't it or you could sell it it's two pence half penny or three pence a cob at the stores so if you had say fifty plants and if each produced how many do they produce on a plant oh well if you don't know let's be on the safe side and say one each that would be a clear profit of well at three pence each let's see fifty pence is four and two pence and three times would be twelve and six pence say twelve shillings allowing six pence for seed so that would be well worth trying in case the moratorium never ends then there would have to be cabbages and such like how about digging up the orchard and oh yes said virginia scornfully she had picked up the paper and read to the end of the aforementioned article which had proved very enlightening and i suppose you expect it all to grow under a couple of feet of snow let me tell you that it is now too late to plant anything but onions he she or it who wrote this article says so i myself had been going to tell her when i could get a word in that it was too late for most of the things she had named but ursula who had never done any vegetable gardening was still sceptical that was why i suggested that we should consult the obliging manager at carter's in queen victoria street as we often did over our gardening woes just ahead of us in the shop when we got there was an elderly gentleman who wanted some grass seed he asked if they would tell him how to start a lawn next spring it was in the middle of the day a very busy time for a shop of this kind when city men are on their way to or from lunch and sees a few extra minutes to buy their seeds the shop was full it looked as though every scrap of land within the twelve-mile radius was going to be put under cultivation and the assistants had all their work to serve everyone as quickly as they wanted to be served 
the elderly gentleman was apparently the only one who was not in a hurry so he asked the most minute questions and the manager gave him copious directions from preparing the ground at the start right up to marking it off for tennis when it was in its prime though judging by the small packet of seed the e g had bought the lawn would never support a tennis net then by the time the shop was quite packed and when everything that was possible appeared to have been said about planting and maintaining a lawn including keeping it free from moss the best way to trim the edges the law with regard to trespassing fowls and the careful tying of black cotton over the newly planted seeds to keep off the birds the e g asked what he should do when daisies came up the manager said patiently that his firm's grass seeds didn't produce daisies but as the e g seemed to worry about daisies he was told how to get rid of daisies at last he really went reluctantly i admit but the other customers who had all become so engrossed in his lawn that they couldn't remember what they had come in to buy for themselves heaved a sigh of relief slowly he made his way to the middle of the wide crossing just in front of the shop you knew by his hesitating walk that there was another question he had meant to ask but he couldn't recall it for the moment yes he suddenly turned round briskly and nearly ended the lawn under a taxi the shop door opened again and an anxious voice inquired what ought i to do if the birds get at the seeds in spite of the black cotton and the bits of white rag tied to them the manager passed his hand across what looked like an aching brow and further braced himself to do his duty but a gentleman customer came to the rescue by replying it is usual in such a case sir to buy another packet of grass seed and start all over again on exactly the same lines as before only you plant an extra reel of black cotton this time after this we were able to inquire of the manager what crops he would advise us to plant as our contribution to the nation's larder to say nothing of our own onions he said so promptly that one would have thought others had asked the same question and then he added giant roca i am not sure how many pounds of seed ursula immediately ordered she proposed to make it a present to me and naturally wished to be generous virginia says she believes she heard her say a half a hundred weight anyhow the obliging manager asked with a slight cough how large a portion of ground we were intending to cultivate as half an ounce would be sufficient for i forget how many acres so she reduced her order to half a pound she said she didn't want us to run short i don't fancy we shall either besides she rather liked the name giant roca it suggested something large and strengthening wherewith to combat the foe we hadn't a moment's rest after we arrived at the cottage until the onion seed was well underground ursula decided that it would be really a blessing if i would go out she could then plant in peace the handyman being unable to oblige me by doing a little work just then she had decided to plant the seeds herself at first she had made long troughs in which to place the seed sprinkling it very finely with thumb and finger but after half an hour of this spine-breaking work she straightened her back with difficulty and decided that to so broadcast was more in accordance with nature herself to say nothing of biblical teaching hence we had it broadcast here i may say that we eventually had giant rocas sown the length and breadth of the vegetable garden in between the rows of spring greens as well in open spaces 
also they are sending up their spears between rows of snapdragons round standard rose trees in the beds usually devoted to darwin tulips down the narrow bed that has persian irises in the centre and double daisies at the edge in the rough bed of foxgloves at the back of the pigsty along the edge of the borders where sweet alyssum bloomed in the summer under the damson tree where the ground is bare along by the south wall where the sweet pea remains were pulled up to make room for them among the raspberry canes all over the potato patch along with the carnation cuttings in the cold frame and little dibbles among the strawberry plants and i even found a few pots each with a bit of glass over the top placed in the sunny scullery window which also proved to be giant rocas in case we should run short indoors when all these rocas have attained to their gigantic proportions i fancy we shall be able to scent that garden a mile or two away still the onions were only being planted the day i set out for a walk wandering just where the road might chance to lead me but you have to take yourself with you if you go for a walk and it is some time before you can get away from yourself if you can make out what i mean by this i merely walked on and on looking at the blackbirds gobbling down the red mountain ash berries till one gasped at their stowing away capacity at the swallows practising their long sweeping flights preparatory to leaving us at the ferns growing out of the shady side of the walls at a great patch of rich purple in the corner of a field that turned out to be a widespread tangle of flowering vetch at the beautiful colour effect of massed heliotrope michaelmas daisies against the grey-green background of a mossy fern-decked old stone wall at the harebells swinging in the wind at the late foxgloves still poking beautiful spikes of colour through the hedges at the blackberries trailing over everything at the butterflies still flitting about or resting motionless with outspread wings where they found a warm sunny stone or gorging themselves to repletion on some overripe pears that had fallen by the roadside there were several lovely creatures with blue-black wings marked with red white and a little blue who like the wasps were actually intoxicated with pear juice a fox slunk across the road right in front of me and plunged into a wood probably having the time of his life just now with most of the hunt somewhere in france the springs were coming to life again after the heavy rain and water burbled along at the side of the lane or tumbled out from the rocks at the roadside in tiny waterfalls the orchard trees were flecked all over with gold or pale yellow or bright crimson surely we never had a more abundant apple year than this one it was such a wonderful afternoon i was bound to go on wandering at last i came to the end of the lanes and found myself on an open hilltop as the fresh bracing air met me full in the face i began to feel hungry i looked at my watch it was five o'clock I looked at the landscape, and realized that, although I didn't know where I was, I was certainly miles away from any tea. I paused and considered, should I carefully retrace my steps? That always seems a poor-spirited way of getting home again, even though you are lost. On all sides stretched an expanse of hilly country, grey lichen-covered boulders, yellow-flowered gorse, wiry mauve and purple heather and a wealth of green and bronze and golden-tinted bracken with occasional woods and larch plantations there was a general hum of bees and insects in the air and a pheasant rose from the ground close to me and flew with a whirr into a little coppice nearby a signboard was lying on the ground by the gate leading into the coppice it was the worse for wind and weather but one could still read the alarming warning trespassers will be prosecuted 
who would trespass and who would prosecute on that wild bit of moorland i wonder the only being in sight was a rabbit sitting motionless close beside the prostrate notice and studying me silently with the air of a special constable yet even he went off and left me quite alone at that moment i caught sight of a chimney over the spur of the hill i felt convinced it must be attached to a fireplace and surely there would be a kettle on that fire i made a bee-line for the place to the eye of the town dweller hill and moorland distances are apt to be deceptive the house proved to be much farther off than i had at first imagined but this gave added zest to expedition i determined to reach it though i only arrived in time to put up there for the night a nearer view showed the cottage to be the fag end of a small hamlet lying snugly in the protecting hollow of the hills when i actually entered the village there were so many pretty dwellings and they all looked equally inviting that i was undecided where to open an attack however i settled on one that had a couple of hollyhocks some late pinks and a black currant bush growing out of the top of the garden wall while a free and easy grapevine a tall monthly rose and some clematis waved arms of welcome to me from the front of the cottage just as i approached the gate a pleasant-faced woman came out of the door and walked down the garden path between the french marigolds that edged the flower-beds she was the only sign of life in the place apart from a few belated hens who being averse to early rising i suppose had determined to take time by the forelock and were catching the historic early worm overnight i felt that the good lady's appearance was a distinct indication that fate had decided i must have my tea there nevertheless there were signs that she was bound on some important errand instead of the ordinary sunbonnet or battered hat that is the usual weekday headgear among our hills she had donned a carefully brushed though somewhat rusty black bonnet and a black beaded mantle of unquestionable antiquity both worn with the air of her sunday best good evening i began i'm sorry to trouble you but i wonder if you can tell me where the chapel replied the woman before i could finish my sentence why of course you can't find and but you just come along with me i'm going there myself and though we'm a bit late it don't matter my man'll be keeping a seat for me and there'll be room sure enough for he to squeeze in too i do always tellin our chapel didn't ought to be where tis no place o worship was ever more hid out of road than harn yet my man do say tis clear enough to seein if you'm comin long the lower road for there tis all to once but as i say to him the folk don't all a come down long the lower road and if you come up long why there's no chapel to be seen and then where me too what i do say is the way o salvation oughter be so plain that the wayfarin man though a fool can't lose un and now here be you to prove me very words the good soul was all this time trotting energetically along what i concluded could not be the lower road since no chapel was in view i just followed wondering what would happen next meanwhile my companion talked with scarcely calm a pause for breath but i'm glad to happen to be late or you might have been wandering down till you're all miss amazed soon as i saw you coming up long i said to father i was just settling him comfortable for the night father i said here's a lady a-looking for the chapel sure enough i shouldn't wonder a bit but what she's come to speak at the meeting like as not she's a friend of the minister and pears she's lost i suppose you belong to london ma'am this with a glance all over me to make sure there was no local hallmark my home is in london i replied but just at present i'm staying at woodacres you've walked all the way from woodacres she exclaimed yes and i'm terribly hungry i said hurriedly seizing my chance 
at this the kind hospitable soul was most concerned and insisted on our turning into a relative's house which we were passing at the moment the door stood open though the place seemed to be deserted myra she called out a girl came downstairs with some pocket handkerchiefs in her hand which she appeared to be marking in red there was a hurried whisper in a back room and quickly she brought in a glass of milk and some bread and butter for which i was truly thankful the lady do look wished my companion explained to the girl she's walked from woodacres to hear the minister from london she lost her way and so didn't get in time for the tea meeting i was interested in this item of information about myself but decided to let the unexpected situation develop as it pleased we were soon walking along the road again my companion talking the whole time myra was her niece going to bristol next week to start in a draper's shop she says tisn't stylish nowadays to let folks think as you does your washing yourself so she's making sort of red oughts and crosses in the corner that the other girls will think as the washing was put out put out indeed with utter scorn of voice isn't it all put out i asks her how could they dry an else i've no patience with such fangles that i haven't and isn't this war dreadful i see in the paper i was a readin to father that that kaiser do call it a righteous war a righteous war when he don't even leave off a fighting of a sunday just then we turned a corner and the maligned chapel certainly burst into view all at once the first thing to attract attention as we neared the modest building was a large board above the front entrance displaying the words revival meetings in bold white letters pasted on a red turkey twill background a hymn was progressing when we entered a seat had been reserved for the cottager by her husband and had been left in charge of his hat turned upside down and holding a red pocket handkerchief covered with large white spots while he himself distributed hymn books with backs all suffering from spinal complaint in a more or less acute form by dint of energetic compression on the part of the good-natured occupants of the pew room was made for me as well as for my companion the owner of the hat electing to stand in the aisle as became a pillar of the church the conspicuous crease adorning each trouser leg and the back of his black coat proclaimed them his best clothes and gave additional evidence that the meeting was of more than ordinary weekday importance the place was packed to its utmost capacity i decided that i had never in my whole life heard a harmonium more asthmatically out of tune and at the same time i wished that the lamps which were economically turned down daylight being still visible could only be raised since the odour of paraffin was not a refreshing ingredient to add to the air of the already close room for on our hills as in other places where fresh air is most abundant ventilation is the least among the virtues practised by the natives the congregation took some slight adjustment before all managed to wedge themselves into the seats after the hymn the general shuffle and scuffle having subsided a man on the platform addressed the assembly i am sorry to say our brother has not yet arrived the glow of expectancy on the faces of the people suddenly vanished we think he has made a mistake over the time of commencement possibly he imagines it is seven instead of six o'clock but he is certainly coming or he would have telegraphed the disappointed ones looked hopeful again two friends have driven off to meet him many heads craned round in the direction of the door though the honoured pair were now a couple of miles away and they will doubtless bring him along as quickly as possible i think we may safely rely on him being here in about half an hour all eyes now scanned the face of the clock in the meanwhile we will hold a short testimony meeting and perhaps brother wilson will first of all lead us in prayer the man with the hymn-books standing in the aisle responded 
without a moment's halt or hesitation he poured forth a torrent of mingled appeal confession praise and request he touched on their week of services on themselves as a church on the village and according to his view its state of spiritual darkness then he went further afield and dealt with the whole of england the sailors on our warships and the soldiers on the battlefields this thought led him to mention the colonies the missionaries labouring in foreign lands and then he prayed for the heathen who lived so far away that no missionary had yet reached them he concluded with a plea for all backsliders and a paean of gratitude for those who were saved the congregation followed the long prayer intently punctuating every remark with amen and many other expressions of assent uttered devoutly though fervently then the one who presided asked all who had received a blessing that week to testify to the others of the great things that had befallen them he sat down after a pause of but half a minute a woman rose saying in a quiet voice i feel i ought to take the earliest opportunity of telling how good god has been to me i came to these meetings as hopeless as any human being could very well be but god has lifted the load from my soul and now although i cannot see any light ahead he has shown me he is near and i am content to walk by faith and i know the light will come soon she sat down and the only sound that broke the stillness was the voice of the chairman commit thy way unto the lord trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass a decrepit old man next hobbled to his feet his voice was feeble but the peaceful look on his wrinkled face and the light that shone in his eyes carried wonderful conviction with them he was somewhat diffuse but dwelt on all the goodness that had fallen to his lot through life and his eager anticipation of the call that should summon him home when once the ice was broken the people followed one another as fast as they could an elderly woman sitting next to me rose to her feet steadying herself by holding on to the pew in front with her work-worn hands for she was trembling she spoke in a hesitating manner yet what she said had infinite pathos in it would they remember in their prayers the lads who were fighting so far away some out of reach of any services like these that they might not forget the god of their father and mother and that they might be brought back safely to the old home again and the poor woman who was evidently much overwrought just sat down and hid her face in her handkerchief i couldn't help putting my hand over hers in sympathy there were many other bowed heads in the meeting by then old careworn women as well as younger ones old men in plenty but so few young fellows let us pray said the chairman all eyes were closed there was a slight pause and then another voice full of wonderful restfulness sent up a prayer to the great comforter on behalf of all the mothers and fathers present who night and day were longing for their son's return and for the wives who with aching hearts were hungering for news of the absent loved ones the prayer was very simple and unconventional just the asking of a boon from a friend but the speaker understood the heartbreaks that were in those suppressed sobs and his words brought comfort to many a lonely one that night when he ceased the lamps were all raised and there on the rostrum was one of the greatest if not the greatest of the preachers of our times the minister from london had arrived i was amazed when i saw him there a man who preached every sunday to congregations numbering several thousands whose name was the most powerful attraction that could be found for a may meeting poster or a convention programme a theologian whose lectures and writings were followed with the closest attention by hundreds of students as he stood up in that small village chapel the first thought that came into my mind was something like this what a waste to have such a big man at a small meeting like this when he could easily fill albert hall 
and in any case he will probably be right above their heads he is far too scholarly for these simple-minded uneducated people he will be quite lost on them what i forgot was the fact that after all it is the message that counts in such a case the famous preacher had a message for humanity and he was great enough to be able to deliver it in a way that would be understood by any one rich or poor educated or illiterate and he was wise enough to know that he might be doing a big work in speaking to that handful of people in that remote corner of england seeing that a chance visit had brought him into the vicinity therefore when they had asked him if he would speak at the revival meetings they were holding he had consented at once and i was not the only one who had reason to be grateful to god for the preacher's words that night mine was not the only heavy heart that had come into the little chapel badly in need of an uplift i was not the only one who felt almost alone in a losing cause with all the old-time beliefs tottering he read from revelation seven in the revised version after these things i saw and behold a great multitude which no man could number out of every nation and of all the tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb arrayed in white robes and palms in their hands and they cry with a great voice saying salvation unto our god which sitteth on the throne and unto the lamb and one of the elders answered saying unto me these which are arrayed in the white robes who are they and whence came they and i say unto him my lord thou knowest and he said to me these are they which come out of the great tribulation and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb therefore are they before the throne of god and they serve him day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them they shall hunger no more neither thirst any more neither shall the sun strike upon them nor any heat for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them unto fountains of waters of life and god shall wipe away every tear from their eyes there was a moment's silence as he closed his bible and then he began to talk to the little crowd before him not about the war but about much that the war is bringing trouble sorrow suffering anxiety great tribulation indeed i'm not going to make any attempt to give you a sermon merely to take isolated sentences from a man's address and set them down in cold print deprived of the added strength and meaning that voice and tone and emphasis and context convey is usually most unsatisfactory but i wish you could have been there and seen the tense eager look on every face as he took us quickly and concisely over the great crises that have befallen humanity in bygone ages when it has seemed again and again as though christianity has been dealt a staggering blow and yet in every case the result has been the ultimate triumph of god and the building up of his people he reminded us how the darkest day in the world's history when our lord's death seemed to end all hope all promise of his kingdom was in reality the day of the greatest victory but i cannot give even a summary of his address i can only tell you of the effect it had upon me and i think there were many others to whom light came in a strangely vivid manner that evening it seemed as though i was suddenly taken right out of my own small petty troubles and shown a bigger view of the world than i had ever seen in my widest imaginings before things that had been perplexing bewildering before seemed to fit in quite naturally into a huge plan that was making for the ultimate good of humanity but more than all this there suddenly came that enheartening sense of being no longer a unit no longer one of a small company fighting against overwhelming odds i was now one of a huge army that had been marching on through all time an army that will still be adding and adding to its numbers so long as the world shall last 
i seemed to hear the trampling of the feet the great surge of the voices as they sang the old yet ever new anthem salvation unto our god which sitteth on the throne and unto the lamb blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be unto our god for ever and ever here was no room for doubt no question as to ultimate results no misgivings no apprehensions the final victory did not rest with me but i was privileged to take part in it if i was willing to endure any hardships or tribulation that might happen by the way and even these seemed so slight not to be mentioned beside the joy of the great triumph that was surely ahead the vision comes to us all differently at different times in a different manner but assuredly i had a glimpse then of the things that are outside our everyday ken i knew for an absolute certainty that i was one of the greatest army that can ever be mustered i knew for an absolute certainty that god is leading this army and that with him there is no possibility of failure and that finally he will permit evil to be banished and good will prevail i realized that any afflictions we are called upon to bear here are but for a moment nothing can hinder the progress of the great multitude that no man can number christ's followers through all the ages in spite of all the tribulation because of the tribulation they reach his throne at last and worship him while he wipes away the tears that may have gathered by the way my thoughts had journeyed far away from the little chapel and its earnest worshippers i was recalled by the preacher's voice reciting his closing sentence and i saw and i heard a voice of many angels round the throne and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a great voice worthy is the lamb that hath been slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing we stood up to sing the concluding hymn one that has long been a great favourite of mine coming coming yes they are coming coming from afar from the wild and scorching desert afric's sons of colour deep jesu's love has drawn and won them at the cross they bow and weep coming coming yes they are coming coming from afar from the indies and the ganges steady flows the living stream to love's ocean to his bosom calvary their wandering theme coming coming yes they are coming coming from afar from the steppes of russia dreary from slavonia's scattered lands they are yielding soul and spirit into jesu's loving hands coming coming yes they are coming coming from afar from the frozen realms of midnight over many a weary mile to exchange their souls long winter for the summer of his smile coming coming yes they are coming coming from afar all to meet in plains of glory all to sing his praises sweet what a chorus what a meeting with the family complete and how that hymn was sung it all seemed part of the music of the great army no longer we thought primarily of the troops rallying to the call of the mother country and coming from the far ends of the world to fight in earthly warfare our souls saw farther than this a multitude out of every nation of all tribes and peoples and tongues ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands all marching under the banner of the lord jehovah i had received the answer to the questions i had been asking earlier in the day what had christianity accomplished it had accomplished this it had enlisted this mighty stream of humanity we in that humble little chapel were merely a small handful but we belonged to that great army we had only to march on trusting and worshipping god 
was it possible that i had been picturing myself one of a small force struggling for right that was in danger of being overmastered by might now i saw ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands on ahead of me and could even hear the tramp and the singing of the tens of thousands that would follow on after me oh it was wonderful to feel oneself in such a mighty company at the close while i was exchanging greetings with the preacher my friend who had brought me to the chapel busied herself in finding some one who would be driving home in my direction the meeting had been attended by people from many miles round she discovered that a farmer and his wife were driving within a quarter of a mile of my cottage and i was placed in their trap carefully wrapped up in a warm paisley shawl that had been produced from somewhere the night being described as a bit freshish after all the drives we've had we didn't talk much on the homeward journey my companions were thinking some deep thoughts i was certain from the few remarks they let drop but we english do not easily betray our hearts in public hence the farthest the farmer's wife got was the remark i dearly like to hear he again to which her husband replied ay for sure they told me the meetings had been much blessed but this one was the best of all oh yes quite different from the others no the usual congregation was not as large as this only about forty the village was small but people had come from all over the hills this week to-day twenty had walked in from brownbrook that was seven miles each way they went on without any connecting link to say they felt sure the english would win there was no doubt in their minds about this one could see and then the reason was clear our tom's there the woman explained to me as though i of course knew our tom and his presence at the front settled the matter and i thought of the many fathers and mothers who were looking away across the straits with just that pride and faith because our tom is helping his country at last we came to the little lane that turned off from the turnpike road and led to my cottage and i said good-bye to my companions the small white dog with the brown ears had heard my footsteps and had run out joyfully to meet me he had begun to be seriously concerned as to whether he would ever get a proper meal again the night was certainly a bit freshish but a glorious moon was out and the hills were all high lights and deep shadows i stopped a moment at my own gate to look down at the old grey abbey lying in the valley seven hundred feet below everything was still and peaceful only an owl called to another one in the steep woods across the river and a couple of baby owls answered an apple fell with a dull thud whenever the wind drifted across the orchard it was so quiet so restful it was difficult to think there was lurid war fog away beyond those hills then suddenly as i watched i saw in the distance a procession of swinging twinkling lights moving along a footpath that cut through a wood and crossed a low spur of the hills for the moment i wondered what it was but in an instant i knew it was the party from brownbrook on their homeward tramp and their lanterns were lighting them down the rugged precipitous footpath that was lying in deep shadow when they reached the level road they started singing their voices in beautiful harmony rising up and echoing again and again against the steep hillsides was i thinking of battlefields with a saddened heart again no the cloud had lifted from my soul i could look for something better something more world-wide in its effects than even this terrible war and as i stood thinking all this the words came up to me that they were singing as they tramped along the silent moonlit road at the foot of the forest-clad hills coming coming yes they are coming coming from afar all to meet in plains of glory all to sing his praises sweet what a chorus what a meeting with the family complete end of section eleven Section 12 
of Flower Patch Among the Hills. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Flower Patch Among the Hills by Flora Clickman. The Little People of the Streams. Have you ever heard the little people of the streams singing in the night? I wonder. Once you have heard their music, you will never forget it. The first time I heard it was one February. Shortly after I had taken the cottage, the season above all others when the brooks and falls and mountain springs are over full of water that hurries along at a great pace tumbling over rocks, dropping down into green wells and grottoes below, always galloping downhill, till finally it reaches the ever-rushing river in the valley. By day, each brook seems merely to be chatting sociably to the banks, and the long, heart's tongue ferns as it passes down, and you only hear one at a time. But after dark, when most other sounds have ceased, the voices of the streams seem to grow marvelously in volume. I was lying awake one night with the windows open, listening literally to the sound of many waters, and trying to disentangle them. First I heard the spring outside my garden gate as it scrambled down from the hillside above, splashing the overhanging greenery with light spray, and finally pouring out of a little trough, dark brown wood, closely enameled with green mosses, into a rocky pool where it ceases its swirl for half a minute, just while it gets its breath, before rushing on down the hill, finding its own way around, or over all sorts of obstacles, and resenting any interference of man soon i could distinguish a second brook that serves a cottage a quarter of a mile further along the lane before it winds about and enters my lower orchard this had overflowed in the orchard and was having quite a gay time running skittishly out of the orchard gate and into another lane instead of pursuing its proper course next i was able to detach the conversation of the small waterfall that drops about a hundred feet from an overhanging ledge of a rock into a green cave under the hill where mosses of wonderful size abound and yellow flags stand guard at the entrance with creeping jenny and forget-me-nots just outside the sound always seems to increase as you listen and soon i detected the noise of the river as it tears over successive weirs. If the tide is low, it is often a roar when you stand on the river bank beside a weir. But up here on the heights the noise is softened to a purling sound that runs like a never-ceasing ground bass or pedal note amid the fluctuating tones of the nearer streams. Other and more distant murmurings floated in at the window but one could never allocate them all, for, excepting in the hottest weather, this is in truth a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. I was thinking of this, when suddenly the babbling of the water was drowned in the sound of wonderful bells that rose upon the night air. It was not from our village church. That possesses only one bell, whose sound, unfortunately, resembles nothing so much as a cracked iron shovel struck with a pair of tongs. And there is no other bell for miles around. And yet there was no mistaking it. I could distinctly hear the joyous clashing and clanging of bells in a tall steeple. It was no brazen banging, rather some fairy music, like the carillon at Moline, which I am proud to remember I once played, 
though, alas, I shall never play it again. I listened in amazement. Soon was added the sound of voices, like subdued distant singing in some vast cathedral, while the bells still clashed outside. Yet it was never close at hand. It always seemed to float to me from a distance. I was sure I was not asleep, for I knew where I was, and decided to get up and go to the window, when the dog barked. Probably he could hear a fox prowling around outside. Instantly the spell was broken. I opened my eyes. There was no sound but the murmuring and burbling of the brooks. Like a sensible person, I, of course, decided that I had been dreaming. Yet again and again have I heard the clanging bells, with often the sound of an organ and singing wafted through the open window. It always comes when the streams are most impetuous, and when I am in that lotus-flowering land that lies between awakeness and sleep. The music is always enthrallingly happy, and my only regret is that the bells and the singers do not come a trifle nearer, so that I could catch every note and jot it all down for future reference. I related my experiences to one or two people, but this was all the information they seemed able to give me. If I were you, I should run down to Margate for a week or so, and leave all work behind. Go to a nice bright boarding house, where there are lots of people, and enjoy yourself, and forget about that wretched cottage. You've been overdoing it lately. I had another friend just like you. Got a little peculiar, you know. And then, well, I won't tell you any more. Don't want to make you nervous, of course. But her mother never got over it. And so well-connected, too. Kept three motors. You take my advice. I'll send you the name of a charming boarding house I know. Etc. Then I kept my own counsel and decided that there were little people living in the streams, just as I had always liked to picture them living in the flowers and under the mushrooms, and the music I heard was the little people singing and ringing all the harebells and foxglove bells that grow along the banks of the brooks. I concluded that no one had ever heard them but myself, but to my surprise, one day, I found that others did know about these little people. I was reading The Forest by Stuart E. White, where he describes his impressions and experiences as he lay awake at night in a tent on the banks of a Canadian river, when I came upon the following that in many points coincides with my own sensations. In such circumstances, you will hear what the boatmen call the voices of the rapids. Many people never hear them at all. They speak very soft and low, and distinct beneath the steady roar and dashing beneath even the lesser tinklings and gurglings, whose quality superimposes them over the louder sounds. In the stillness of your hazy half-consciousness they speak, when you bend your attention to listen, they are gone, and only the tumults and the tinklings remain. But in the moments of their audibility, they are very distinct. Just as often an odor will awake all a vanished memory, so these voices, by the force of a large impressionism, suggest whole scenes. Far off are the cling clang cling of chimes and the swell and fall murmur of a multitude and fete, so that subtly you feel the gray old town, with its walls, the crowded marketplace, the decent peasant crowd, the booths, the mellow church building with its bells, the warm dust-moted sun, or in the pauses between the swish-dash-dashings of the waters, sound faint and clear voices singing intermittently. 
calls distant notes of laughter as though many canoes were working against the current only the flotilla never gets any nearer nor the voices louder the boatmen call these mist people the huntsmen and look frightened curiously enough by all reports they suggest always peacefulness a harvest field a street fair a sunday morning in a cathedral town careless travellers never the turmoils and struggles perhaps this is the great mother's compensation in a harsh mode of life nothing is more fantastically unreal to tell about nothing more concretely real to experience than this undernote of the quick water and when you do lie awake at night it is always making its unobtrusive appeal gradually its hypnotic spell works the distant chimes ring louder and nearer as you cross the borderland of sleep and then outside the tent some little woods noise snaps the thread an owl hoots a whippoorwill cries a twig cracks beneath the cautious prowl of some night creature at once the yellow sunlit french windows puff away you are staring at the blurred image of the moon spraying through the texture of your tent since reading this i have spoken of the matter to others with more courage and although the majority do not seem to have come across them i have discovered several people who have heard the little people singing some indeed have been kind enough to attempt to give me a lucid explanation of what they are pleased to call a very simple natural phenomenon and they prattle of enharmics and sound vibrations of nodes and supertones in a very impressive manner one tells me the whole thing is merely a psychological emotion vibrating in sympathy with the acoustical environment i dare say personally i would just as soon leave it unelucidated there are certain moods in which i do not want such things as nature and love and beauty and self-sacrifice explained it is enough for me that they are and that i have been permitted to enjoy them and although i know that the little people are not necessarily wearing gauze wings and white frocks and stars in their hair as i pictured them in my first childhood i still like to think that even in the brooks something is singing something rejoicing something giving thanks for the gift of life end of section 12section thirteen of flower patch among the hills this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by nemo flower patch among the hills by flora clickman the funeral of the hero it was three months after the funeral of the village hero now i come to think of it i haven't mentioned the funeral before the hero a porter at the little railway station enlisted very early in the campaign our village in the main did nobly in the way of early enlistment a quiet retiring young fellow he had never singled himself out for any sort of notoriety though i personally had always remarked on his unvarying courtesy and his willingness to do everything he could to assist passengers the news of his death was the first thing to bring the war actually home to our isolated corner of the world people had known he was ill because his wife had been summoned to a military hospital some weeks before when his condition was pronounced critical 
but no one had really anticipated the worst till it came and then the word passed quickly from cottage to cottage poor alex gone eh hey, you don't say so ain't it just like they huns to go and kill off the best of the bunch said one woman who never had a good word for the lad during his lifetime one and all agreed forthwith that proper respect must be shown to the remains and those who didn't intend to inconvenience themselves by fighting felt they were serving their country nobly by seeing that poor alec had a handsome funeral the news of his death reached the village on friday on saturday the older members of the family selected the spot for his grave in the little churchyard as of course he must be buried near his home by sunday all the relatives to the remotest generation wore deep mourning to church thanks to the superhuman efforts of the village dressmaker and numerous ready-maids purchased in the nearest town the rector was in a nursing home in london at the time but the curate though only newly arrived preached a moving sermon extolling the courage of the young man who had died with his face to the foe braving the falling shells and raining bullets in order to defend his country the sentiment was right alec was willing to do all that but in reality he never got beyond a training camp on the east coast where the air proving too bleak for him after the mildness of the west he had gone down with pneumonia the new curate didn't know that however and everybody said it was a beautiful sermon and went and told the poor mother about it as she had been too grief-stricken to go to church so far the widow had not written herself but that wasn't surprising she would be too broken down with trouble willing heads and hands did all they could however to anticipate her wishes they telegraphed to the former curate now the vicar of a crowded lancashire parish and asked if he would conduct the funeral he had known the deceased from boyhood he wired back yes send day and hour they sent to uncles and aunts and cousins throughout great britain all who could arrived to post haste on monday and what a gathering it was of outstanding members of the clan those who hadn't recognized each other's existence for years now forgot their ancient feuds while one and all discovered such good qualities in the poor lad and were so anxious to insist on the nearness of their relationship that his death did not seem altogether in vain i myself wrote a note to the widow only waiting to post it till i could get her address miss bretherton the rector's niece hurried home from london to do what she could to comfort the parents who were aloof from the general excitement and knew only the sorrow of the occasion while waiting for further details to arrive people made wreaths and discussed how best the engine could be draped in black as there was no letter by tuesday morning and the vicar in lancashire had again asked for particulars the self-constituted committee of management decided to send a wire to the widow after composing and then discarding twenty-six different messages till the post office was threatened with a famine in telegram forms the postmistress came to their assistance and suggested that the wording should be as brief and as straightforward as possible to save misunderstanding and expense eventually they were all persuaded to agree to the following what train will the coffin come by reply paid in about an hour the widow answered whose coffin don't know what you mean alec nearly well the whole village has had three points 
under discussion ever since. 1. Who was it said he was dead? 2. Can a man be made to pay for his own grave, being dug, when he refuses to occupy it? 3. And what is to become of the mourning, anyhow? End of section 13